Coming up now on Headline Humboldt, North Coast Congressman Jared Huffman breaks down the Klamath Dams, describing in detail how the years-long effort to remove four dams on the river culminated recently with the FERC decision to let dam removal proceed. Also, Huffman talks shop, describing how the new political reality in Washington, D.C., with Republicans holding a narrow majority in the House of Representatives, will impact both his party and his constituents. Coming up next on Headline Humboldt. From the top of Humboldt Hill, this is Headline Humboldt. I'm James Falk. Thanks for joining us. So once again, we're about to witness a changing of the guard. While the White House and Senate will remain under Democratic control, the House of Representatives is changing hands. After four years, the Democrats in the last election lost the House majority by a slim margin, allowing for a GOP takeover and the likely elevation of Congressman Kevin McCarthy to the speakership. Current Speaker Nancy Pelosi will lose her post and has decided to step down from leadership entirely, although she will retain her seat. So be it. The question now becomes, how will the GOP handle this power? Will they move ahead responsibly, trying to take the country into a better place for its citizens and endeavor, and endeavor ultimately to make sound use of its authority? Or will we once again succumb to the recurrent drama that seems to so plague the political system and lapse into inaction and brinksmanship? So far, the signs are not good. Not surprisingly, the MAGA wing of the party, while arguably responsible for the disappointing performance of GOP candidates this election cycle, has taken what seems to be an even firmer hold on the agenda, promising to drive wedges between the American people and prioritizing very little in the way of an actual governing plan. We all collectively have to decide whether our concept of self owes more to our national identity as Americans or our often reflexive and inherited choice of political party. I don't believe that the presence of a D or an R next to someone's name can demean or determine good character. There are good Republicans, great Republicans, and certainly awful Democrats. One measure of actual decency, I believe, has to be a willingness to at times abandon party loyalties in order to better serve the nation as a whole. Political party is an affiliation not a marriage, not a soul contract. Honor and truth has to be the highest aim for our political servants. And if it's not, the American people have to be clear and direct in the rejection of such mindless political hackery. As ever, we shall see. We sat down with Congressman Huffman earlier this week to talk about the incoming crowd. Congress, progress in the effort to free the Klamath River, and much more. He described his satisfaction at finally seeing progress made in restoring that troubled watershed. It is huge news, great news, I think, for the North Coast. And, you know, for the entire 10 years that I've been representing this area in Congress, um, it has been all about the process, right? This negotiated settlement, an attempt to get some legislation through Congress to uh, implement it, then a bit of a redirect uh, where the states and Department of Interior and the tribes and Pacific Corps kind of did a workaround because Congress wasn't legislating, uh, and then just this endless FERC proceeding. Uh, and so all many of us have ever thought about or known is a process, and now it's over. It is the final approval, the last hurdle cleared, and truly within weeks uh, we're done with process. We are going to start removing dams on the Klamath River. It's going to be the largest dam removal in American history. It's going to be the best thing to happen for water quality and salmon and steelhead and equity and environmental justice in the lower Klamath River in decades. So I'm very excited about it. Last point, sometimes people think, well, we're in a drought. Why would you remove dams? Zero water supply from any of these dams. They are obsolete hydro dams. Uh, the hydropower is being replaced, uh, and we're going to move forward with a healthier river, which is great news. Now, one of the things I think that the chairman uh, also mentioned was that, uh, you know, we're in a position where energy is at a premium as well. But as he explained, and maybe you could go into it a little bit too, there isn't, that isn't going to be so much of an issue here. Well, it's, it's not. Look, we uh, Pacific Corps has been working for many years now, one of the benefits of this long protracted process is they've had plenty of time to line up replacement power. Uh, that That's just not going to be an issue. Uh, plus, I think one thing we've seen uh, in critical droughts uh, is that hydropower is not the, the kind of bedrock uh, reliable water supply or power supply that it used to be. 
Uh, we're seeing major hydro projects around the West that are not making power right now uh, because of the drought. Yeah. So look, we, we appreciate hydropower where it makes sense, but there's a bunch of dams around the West uh, that have outlived their usefulness. And when that happens, they should come out. I mean, uh, last question on the on the subject, but do you think that there's anything that we've seen in this process that needs to be reformed so as to make this maybe not so protracted, or do you think that the protracted process ended up being a benefit here? Uh, the, the process should always be faster. FERC proceedings just take too long. Yeah. Uh, so we can keep working on that, but I think the scrutiny that that process brought was a good thing. It helped get to a good project this dam removal is not just going to happen willy-nilly. Uh, it's going to be, ha there, there's been just meticulous planning and scrutiny that has gone into this to make sure that, you know, the sediment doesn't contain toxic material, to make sure that there's staged uh, demolition and removal of this infrastructure so that it doesn't cause problems downstream. So all of that, you know, very careful planning, I think, uh, is important because it's going to make this a successful, durable project. I, I guess I'm, I fibbed a little bit. I have one more. Uh, what about precedent? I mean, does this make it easier in the future for this kind of project to, to get approval if we've done it and it's worked effectively? I think so. I think every time you remove a, a major dam that's outlived its usefulness, you demystify the process a little bit. There are still people out there who kind of worship at the altar of dams. They think there is some intrinsic value in dams and they should never be removed and we should have a lot more of them. Uh, the truth is a bunch of dams uh, probably shouldn't have been built and are probably creating more harm than benefit at this stage um, of their life. So um, there, there's more dams that need to come out in the Western United States. And we've got some real success stories now from the Elwha River in Northern Washington state uh, Further down uh, in central California, there's a dam in, in Ventura that has come out and, and a very successful story there, one in the central coast near Salinas. Um, and now this Klamath will be the biggest of all. But these are going to be, uh, I think, very helpful precedents for the other dams that ought to be removed. Not all dams, obviously, we're not um, being categorical on that, but some do need to come out and this makes that easier. So um, we just had an election, obviously, um, and uh, there was a lot of people predicting the you know, infamous uh, red wave. It didn't come to pass. Um, first off, how do you grade the performance of, of the last two years of this past Congress? Well, when you look at the threadbare majority that we had, uh, I mean, just four or five seats in the House most of that time, and in the Senate, um, you know, it's hard to even call it a majority when you have to get through Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema to get anything done because of the filibuster. Mm -hmm. So um, the fact that we've been able to do as much as we have these past two years is really nothing short of remarkable. Uh, and I think that's a testament to the leadership of Speaker Nancy Pelosi, first and foremost. She held a very large, diverse, fractious caucus together, um, and that takes a lot of skill. Uh, but I think it also speaks to the steady hand of the Biden administration. And um, look, it, this is a tough time. The American people have a lot of angst. We're definitely being hurt by inflation. And there's a huge amount of anxiety over all of the, the ripple effects of this Russian war in Ukraine and what it's doing to the global economy. But we are in far better shape than just about every developed nation of the world in dealing with these problems. And we've been able to notch a bunch of really incredible landmark legislative victories that are going to position us well for the future. The Chips and Science Act, which is going to help with our site, uh, supply chains, going to help us recapture global leadership position on science, technology, semiconductor manufacturing. A lot of people aren't even aware we did that in the past two years. But we also stepped up with the largest vaccine rollout in the history of the world that has really brought the pandemic under control and enabled us to get back to, to more of a semblance of normal. And we did this big infrastructure play. And then finally, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is so big on prescription drug pricing reform and climate action. So it's, it's a good story to tell. It wasn't always pretty how we got there, uh, but given the hand we were dealt with those threadbare majorities, uh, it's pretty remarkable. Um you talked about uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, in a leadership position. Obviously, she's stepping down. She's going to remain in Congress, but not 
um, in leadership. Um, what are your thoughts about um, that change in leadership and uh, who do you think uh, might be the future leader? I've heard um, um, Hakeem Jeffries mentioned um, as someone who might take up the, um, the torch, but um, how scary is it to move ahead without Nancy? She's done a lot over the past 20 years. She has done an amazing amount. Uh, she's historic. Um, you know, I was just in COP27 uh, in Egypt with Speaker Pelosi. And on one of those evenings, we were having a, a pretty intimate dinner with Al Gore, who is, you know, also a, a pretty big deal when it comes to, yeah. you know, this country and climate. And um, you could just tell Al, Al Gore had a sense that Nancy may be wrapping it up here. And um, some of the things he said about her, uh, you know, just very much from the heart and very informal. You know, there were no cameras rolling. Uh, but he regards her as one of the most um, historic figures in American history, the best and most effective Speaker of the House in American history. And I think a lot of people would agree with that. I certainly um, agree with it myself. How do you think history will judge the... Uh you know, the sort of mostly oppositional relationship between Nancy Pelosi, yeah. who represents, you know, one segment of the population, and then Donald Trump, who obviously represents sort of the polar opposite. How do you think history is going to look at that? Well, there were some iconic moments, weren't there? There uh, sure were. Her sort of standing up across the table and uh, calling him out, uh, pointing out uh, just the craziness of what he was saying and demonstrating that she was in charge. Um, he didn't know what to do with that. He was incredibly rattled by Nancy Pelosi because she actually knows how to wield power for good. Uh, and all he knows about is, frankly, just being a narcissist. So I think the contrast between Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump will be one of the, the enduring uh, parts of her legacy. Uh, certainly her standing uh, at the Speaker's dais and tearing up his State of the Union speech, which was an atrocity um, and a complete black mark on the history of that institution, that speech that, you know, should be full of statesmanship. Um, you know, it was a provocative thing that she did. I don't think she did it lightly, but those of us that were sitting in the chamber listening to this man, um, frankly, just demean all of us and our country, um, felt a little bit validated uh, by what she did. And, you know, look, people will remember her. Some will hate her. Uh, some will think that she was uh, too combative, but uh, she wielded power like almost no one I've ever seen. Uh, and she was always in command. You saw that in the new video from uh, behind the scenes on January 6th. You know, there were a lot of people with fancy titles there, generals, vice presidents, president of the Senate. Nancy Pelosi was the one in command in that difficult moment, yeah, and that's the phone, just the way yeah. it always is with her. Yeah, a pretty remarkable story. Um, you know, you guys have gone from a narrow majority to now it looks like it's going to be a narrow minority without Nancy. Are, is there some concern that there, the, uh, there may be increased fractiousness as a result of that, or do you feel like Democrats are still um, mostly unified um, coming into this next Congress? Well, transitions can easily be messy and contentious, uh, as everybody knows. But uh, if you contrast what's going on on the Republican side, where there is a full-blown food fight, and Kevin McCarthy, in order to get his 218 votes, is making all sorts of Faustian deals with Marjorie Trader Green and other extreme elements within his MAGA caucus, um, it, it is a mess, and no one knows how it's going to go, and that's probably uh, heralding the way the next two years are going to go. It's going to be chaos and extremism. Uh, meanwhile, on our side, uh, it's an incredibly smooth transition. Uh, there's absolutely no dispute that Hakeem Jeffries is going to be the next Democratic leader, followed by Catherine Clark and um, Pete Aguilar. So um, I, I'm kind of amazed myself that our caucus uh, coalesced so quickly and overwhelmingly around that transition, but that's what's happening. And it's a really good team of young leaders that is stepping up. I think you'll be very impressed by what they bring to the table. Um, now, one thing that was clear after the election was that, um, you know, without gerrymandering um, in Florida, um, it doesn't appear that the Republicans would have gained a majority, or at least, I mean, it couldn't have been any tighter. And it seems like they got five seats just from Florida. 
Um, is there anything that people can do uh, to address that issue? Obviously, the judicial system, or at least the Supreme Court, is taking a hands-off approach to how districts, uh, you know, allocate their their votes and whatnot. But um, when districts are purposely planned in order to ensure a particular political outcome, that smacks of unfairness, and almost everyone agrees universally. And California seems to have a system that kind of threads that needle. I mean, what what can be done? Well, independent redistricting works. We've shown it here in California, and there are a growing number of states around the country that are doing it. Uh, gerrymandering, you're right, certainly helped Republicans in Florida. Uh, it also hurt Democrats in New York, because yeah. quite frankly, the New York legislature overreached and tried to do a very partisan Democratic gerrymander that got struck down by the courts. And so if you look at the seats that we lost in New York, uh, that, too, is the difference between holding the House majority and losing it. So, you know, it was both um, an effective gerrymander in Florida by Republicans and an overreaching, ineffective one with a backlash in New York that cost us the House. And uh, I do agree with the, the premise of your question, uh, James. We, we should try to be try to put an end to partisan gerrymandering once and for all and just have independent redistricting. I mean, if you want to capture the will of the voters, it seems like being, doing it fairly would make the most sense. Um, I was watching uh, a news program today, and they were talking about uh, some of the uh, um, revenge that McCarthy is promising against uh, particular Democratic members. Uh, Adam Schiff and uh, Eric Smallwell or Swalwell are going to be, I guess, booted off the uh, intelligence committees. Um, how is that okay? There's no due process for that kind of thing? Uh, the yeah. leader of the, the speaker gets to determine who's on what committees, no matter what? Well, he can't do it unilaterally. My understanding is that he would have to have a vote uh, of the entire House. And so, look, um, the Republicans have to decide how they want to wield their new, very narrow majority. Uh, if they want to settle partisan scores and be vindictive and pander to the folks on Newsmax and Fox News, yeah, they should, uh, I guess, go after some of these high-profile Democrats that they have, uh, you know, they have smeared Adam Schiff and elevated him into this, uh, you know, partisan straw man that they have to always hate. Uh, the truth is Adam Schiff is a super thoughtful and knowledgeable and, and good member of Congress, and he does belong on the Intel Committee. They've blown up this episode with a, you know, alleged Chinese operative that uh, at one point early in Eric Swalwell's career somehow insinuated herself into his uh, operation, but um, the FBI and everyone else has cleared him he did nothing wrong. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, they've blown that into some, you know, big fake scandal. So, you know, what they're trying to do is settle scores for actual scandals from Republicans who did things that legitimately caused them to have to be removed from committees. And so they're going to use fake stuff uh, to try to settle the score with Democrats. And it's just going to make them look bad. It's going to be more chaos. Uh, but that's what you can expect the next two years. Uh, I don't. I hope they won't get the votes to do it, because these are good members of Congress that should be on those committees. Uh, but they're probably going to try, as well as do all of these salacious investigations into Hunter Biden's laptop and that's what you're going to see for the next two years. Um, so I, I hope the American people take a good, hard look at who these people are, you know, what their values and priorities are. And in 2024, uh, they'll remember that because they're going to have a choice between the circus and folks who actually want to govern and do things that make their lives better. Um, so you mentioned um, COP27. So let's let's talk about that. Uh, there seems to have been some progress made in terms of helping poorer countries get uh, some funds they may need to make some remediation to their to their systems. But maybe the um, it's a disappointment because there wasn't as ambitious a goal set or the yeah. 1.5 deg Celsius degree limit maybe slipping, um, you know, out of our grasp. Um, is limiting the impact of, on climate to 1.5 degrees, is that a thing of the past, do you think? It can't be a thing of the past, because if we allow that to happen, James, um, you know, we're, we're talking about runaway warming uh, and large swaths of this planet becoming unlivable and all of the calamity that goes along with that. I mean, refugee crises that will make 
Ukraine and Syria uh, and other recent refugee problems, you know, look like a walk in the park. So um, we, we have got to redirect, I think. I'm disappointed that COP27 didn't culminate in stronger um, specific commitments about phasing down fossil fuel and stronger specific national um, greenhouse gas reduction commitments from a bunch of countries. We now shift to the G20 and the G7, which are the largest economies in the world, and that's the bulk of the emissions. And we got to lean heavily on those countries. Look, look, what stood in the way of us getting that stronger language in COP27 was the fossil fuel states, Saudi Arabia, Russia, uh, China was not helpful as well. So we're just going to have to keep at it. Giving up is not an option because this is existential. Mm -hmm. But I think now the challenge is to try to make progress in those other forms. You know, interested in the relationship of the United States to Saudi Arabia. I mean, there's um, they still control a lot of the gas supply so they can manipulate prices. They are limiting our progress in climate. We've just uh, basically said that the crown prince is shielded from the investigation into the killing of Khashoggi, um, aren't we giving up a lot and not really getting anything in return? Uh, that's a fair description of our relationship with the Saudis. The Saudis are not our friends. And historically, in return for, frankly, a reliable supply of oil, uh, we were willing to hold our nose and do all kinds of things uh, to advantage the Saudis. I really think we have to reevaluate you know, that entire paradigm. Uh, we do not need their oil anymore. If we're interested in tackling the climate crisis, you know, we need to actually phase down all fossil fuel, including theirs. So um, if you take that off the table, you're then left with a petro state with some of the worst human rights violations you'll find anywhere in the world and a terrible track record um, you know, relative, relative to our country and, and many other countries. So um, I think it's time to, to absolutely reevaluate our relationship with the Saudis. Uh, it should not be a sweetheart relationship where we look past all of this bad conduct. Uh, the COP27 bad behavior uh, was just the latest example. They're, they're a bad actor. Um, you know, it seems like there's a pattern that develops between countries that deal primarily in gas and oil for their economic well-being and their outsized impact and um, often malevolent, you know, uh, consequence of, of their, you know, their business practices or whatever. And I don't know how we get a handle on that, but it seems self-evident. I, I think it's inherent in fossil fuel, uh, honestly. You know, the resource curse that has afflicted all of these developing nations where they find deposits of fossil fuel and they bring in, um, you know, these multinational corporations to extract it, thinking that that's going to be their ticket to um, economic development. And it never works out very well. It always leads to corruption and wars and all kinds of environmental justice problems. And so uh, there is a better way, and that is clean, renewable energy, where no nation anywhere on Earth needs to rely on any other nation, the Saudis, the Russians, or even us, for the energy that powers their economy. Uh, all nations of the world have the ability to be totally independent and self-sufficient. Uh, and that's going to be a far better way to develop it economically. It's going to bring more prosperity. Uh, it's going to avoid this resource curse. And it's going to actually uh, help us save the planet um, and reduce the amount of wars that we fight over oil and gas. Can't wait to see that day. Um, you know, one thing that's interesting to watch uh, as we come out of this COP27 um, you know, uh, meeting and everything else that's gone on in America politically, once again, we're going from a Congress that passed a bunch of ambitious uh, climate action, um, and now we're going back to a Republican House. And so that progress is going to you know, stop for the time being. How frustrating is it to our partners in other countries to see America's political will kind of, you know, yo-yo back and forth? And does it impact our ability to marshal a, a coalition in order to get progress made? It's not helpful, but it doesn't mean that all progress stops. I mean, we've still got the executive branch for at least the next two years, and there are all sorts of uh, regulatory standards and other things that are going to keep moving forward. And we've got the Senate um, and, you know, frankly, a near majority in the House to try to make sure that we support the administration uh, in those things. But you've also got all of the subnational uh, 
uh, progress that will continue in the United States. So I'm talking about states like California and the half dozen or so other states that follow our lead on things like clean car standards. You've got all of the investments from the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law that are going to keep rolling out uh, literally every week, every month, many of those involving clean energy and climate action. And the, the House Republicans are not going to be able to stop that. And then you've got local government and the private sector and a growing, um, I, th I think, momentum for climate action at all of those levels. So, you know, this by no means means that progress has stopped and the rest of the world will see that. They'll see the totality of climate progress from the U.S. And it, it's going to be, um, I think, uh, enough to keep us credibly in a leadership role. Um, last uh, subject, Jack Smith, the new special counsel, looks like that the uh, was appointed um, by the attorney general. Um, do you think that that move was necessary? And how likely is it that even going through the you know the process of appointing someone who would uh, you know ostensibly be fair to the uh, you know the former president, that's not is that going to make any difference? Do you think in how Republicans interpret his work? Uh, nothing will make a difference in terms of how Republicans interpret any of this. They are going to be the aggrieved, you know, uh, decriers of witch hunts no matter what happens. I, I think it's obviously, it's obvious that Merrick Garland, who's a very fair-minded, kind of ponderous, um, judicially uh, disposed uh, leader, um, he wanted to err on the side of, uh, I guess, placating public perception and, and underscoring his fairness. But it won't work. Uh, Fox News and everyone else will tear this new guy apart. They will attack the process as partisan, even though it's not. And it is what it is. So uh, I'm just going to let that play out and trust that um, folks who have spent their careers working on um, the Department of Justice and, and our judicial system know what they're doing. Uh, and I hope that the chips will fall where they will. I, no one should shy away from prosecuting Donald Trump, but no one should obviously pursue him just because, you know, he belongs to the other party. And uh, I have a feeling that, you know, this, this will sort itself out. Yeah. Last question about the January 6th committee. I mean, they took on a process that was uh, hairy and political and controversial yeah. in a lot of ways, and they've delivered. Um, obviously, the final report has yet to come out, but I can, it's safe to say that they changed the conversation. Um, how do you think history will view that body? Yeah, I agree. I think they did change the conversation. They brought out facts that we did not know. They brought out witnesses that, um, you know, really were, were quite revelatory uh, in what they shared. And so history is going to have a better sense of what led up to and what happened on uh, that day. And I think they also set in motion some wheels of accountability that should continue to turn, even though Republicans are about to turn the lights off on this committee. Um, I'm super impressed and grateful for their work. Well, that's all I have for you, Jared. I appreciate your time and being in to talk to us. Thanks for having me. Have a great Thanksgiving. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving to you, too.